Hello, my name is Elizabeth Weiss. I'm the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee, a past secretary of the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, and a retired member of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. We acknowledge that we are hosting this event on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island, known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Wendat and Andeno Shawnee people in the place called Toronto. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's webcast is titled The Road to Mass Eco-Socialist Party with Alan Freeman, Marianne Cirelli and Gary Porter. Alan, Marianne and Gary will speak each up to 15 minutes. Then we will take the questions from the online audience. Audience members can submit a question by accessing the webcast directly from YouTube and by typing the question directly onto the chat column. You can direct your question to any one of the panelists or all three can, can answer. If you like this webcast, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. If you agree with what you hear during this program, please join Socialist Action by signing up at our website, www.socialistaction.ca, or by calling 647-986-1917. Easy to remember, 1917 was the year of the Russian Revol Revolution. So let's begin. Our first panelist, Alan Freeman, served as an economist with Ken Livingstone, Mayor of London, England, before retiring to Manitoba, where Alan has been active in politics, including in solidarity with Venezuela. He was a member of the Dimitri Lakaris campaign for Green Party leader. So welcome, Alan. Unmute yourself. I should know by now, shouldn't I? Is that okay? That's okay. We all do it. Yeah, we all do. So, okay. Well, first of all, I just really want to thank the organizers for organizing this debate. I think it's very interesting. I'm very happy to meet uh, Gary and Marianne, and I think this will be a, a, a great opportunity to exchange views. Now, I'll start off by saying that original title that I proposed for this and which I thought I was going to be speaking to was not the road to an eco-socialist workers party, but breaking out coal on the road to a mass people's party. Now, I'm going to come on to that later. There's no blame attached. I'm just saying that's what I'm speaking to. And I actually don't think that what we should be discussing is either the road to a workers party or an eco-socialist party at this point. So I'll raise your hackles or your interest by making that statement. Now I'm gonna start with a single, simple recommendation. I think the left inside the Greens and the NDP and outside both of them should be working together. And the key to that is a program. I see no reason for anyone to leave any party. I think anyone who wants to fight for a change should do so wherever the battle is joined. But what I'm hoping to get agreement around is that the program really matters. That is, what you're fighting for is more important than where you fight for it. So there's one obvious conclusion. It's not the phone is ringing. I'm terribly sorry about that. I hope it's picked up by my partner. It is. OK. It's not enough to simply be in any party, quote, unquote. You have to actively fight in it for it to have a program, a leadership, MPs and MLAs that really stand up for the needs of the people they represent. But we all take our stands where we find ourselves, and therefore I do particularly welcome a proposal that I know Marianne's going to be talking about, about the One Alliance initiative. But there are many things that I think we can do to work together. Among others, I think that the left and the Greens and the left in the NDP should be looking for ways to form uh, alliances at every possible level to discuss and act on a programme. Now, how can that be if you're in different parties? Well, a programme is for struggle. It's not just for elections. A programme sums up the demands of the people you think should be in control of this country. And it's not just about putting a government in through elections. 
And in fact, one of the big difficulties with a purely parliamentary orientation is that everything gets subordinated to winning seats. So don't rock the boat, keep quiet and do the canvassing. A program is also not the same as a bunch of separate struggles. It's about solidarity and respect between struggles. If you want to defend the planet, you have to defend indigenous rights. If you want to defend workers' rights, you have to defend women's rights. You have to support Black Lives Matter. You have to want to fight for justice. And if you want any of these things, you're going to have to put an end to Canadian extractivism, settle accounts with settler colonialism. You have to stop our government waging an undeclared war against the people of Venezuela and Iran. You have to free Meng Wenzhou and stop blaming Canada for problems that our government created. So by the way, that is also why you can only win ecological change if you're prepared to take on Canadian extractivism and settler colonialism. And that's why eco-socialism has revolutionary content. I don't think it's just about greenwashing. Like any reform, the issue is not whether the demand is reformist, but about how and whether you take it seriously and what you do about it when people stand in your way. I'm going to quickly say something about myself, uh, just because misunderstandings is possible, are possible. Everything that was said about me was true, but I'm also a lifelong revolutionary socialist. I used to be the editor of the, the newspaper Socialist Action UK. Uh, I hate to say the original, but, you know, we were there first. And I'm so glad because imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And I did that during the Falklands War, which was quite an experience. I wrote a biography on Tony Benn. I was a member of Ken Livingston's team, as was said, but I also helped set up his economics unit. And I write a lot of stuff on value theory. So I'm hoping that some of the links to what I've done will be sent via the chat or whatever. Just one thing, I want to stress, I'm not speaking on behalf of any of these institutions. I'm speaking for me. So my main point is I think the left, not just the far left, but the left in general, have a fundamental confusion. And this has run since around 20, 1905 when mass parties started being formed. I think they confuse a party with a caucus or a faction. Call it what you like. I don't mind. So they demand something which can't be done. They want a mass, all-inclusive party that adopts a full works program. That's not going to happen. That sort of thing happens in revolutions. And it's very interesting that all the parties we think of as revolutionary were actually created by revolutions. They didn't first form as revolutionary parties and then overthrow the state. In the process of fighting civil wars and whatever, the revolutionary parties emerged. So this side of revolution, the capitalists and the elites, are going to do everything in their power to make sure a mass party doesn't even adopt a part program of mild reform. And that's where we're at now, because there's a real threat that something like that might happen. That's what's going on with Corbyn in the UK. And that's why Livingston was witch hunted out of office. That's why the Sandersites are being um, fought. And that's why, you know, the battle in the Green Party was a, a hard fought one and will continue to be. So the consequence of that is you can't give up on building a mass party just because it has the wrong program. You have to organize around the key elements of a good program, fight for the mass party to take it up. And that shouldn't even be the main thing you do. You should actually be trying to get the mass struggle to impose on the party what the party has to do on behalf of the people it represents. And you don't do what the Democratic National Committee does with the Black Lives Matter movement, which is to try and subordinate it to getting them into the uh, Senate or the Congress or the presidency. So that's what you have to avoid. You have to Turn it the other way around and say the struggle determines what the party does. You don't have the party telling the struggle what to do. And that's what a caucus does. You don't say, I'm going to leave this party because it subordinates the struggle to the parliamentary movement. You have a caucus which is linked into the mass movement and imposes that on the party. And I think that every attempt to turn a faction into a party, it fails. And that's why Waffle failed. They just left. They quit, in my opinion, looking at it. They weren't even, they didn't wait till they were expelled. And by the way, I think I've 
have the record. I think I've been expelled for every single international, if you count being expelled from the anarchists, which is quite difficult to achieve, but I managed it. So, you know, I my line is stick in there till they kick you out. So that's why I'm not happy with the slogan of an eco-socialist mass party, not because I'm not in favor of eco-socialism, but because you have to win people to that. You have to have a fight for hearts and minds. Many people say, what are you doing with all this fancy nonsense about climate change and tree hugging when there are workers' rights and so on that are at stake? And you have to win them over and explain, actually, you can't have a party that defends humans unless it defends the planet they live in, just as you cannot defend the party the planet they live in unless you actually have a different kind of society so that that's the way i see it by the way i think that was the line of the bolsheviks they didn't actually leave the rsdlp until 1920 and 1912 and then they were really forced to they were a faction within it so uh, there's a whole heap of other stuff about whether we should call it a workers party or a people's party uh, which i think is uh, very unfortunate I'm just going to say what I think is a mass party. And I do take some issue with the phrase workers party. There's an unfortunate gap in the English language. Latin languages distinguish between ouvriers, travailleurs, obreros, trabajadores. The one is the people who have a job in a factory or something like that. That's obreros, that's workers in the narrow sense. The other is travailleur is people who have no alternative but to work if they want to keep themselves alive, which is, as Marx said, people who have nothing to sell but their labor power. And that's much wider. It includes people who have no work, which is actually, by the way, a large majority of people in many countries in the world. So, you know, for example, PT in Brazil is often translated as workers' party. That's a mistranslation. It should actually be the party of labor, because to be effective, a party, whether it's parliamentary or not, has to represent everyone oppressed by capital. And that's not just workers, indigenous people, farmers, felons who don't even have the vote in the USA, mendicants. Uh, so that's why I think People's Party is fine. I know people are worried about the fact that we call it a People's Party and, you know, what's going to happen is rich bastards are going to get in. Well. I have two pieces of news for you. One, there's more of us than they are of them. Second, they're going to get in and start trying to buy, buy your leaders and control what you do, whether or not you put the word people in it. Keir Starmer, who's now battling to kick out Jeremy Corbyn, he, Jeremy Corbyn, he, he, was the, um, he was the head of the public prosecution service in Britain. He's, he's a Sir Keir Starmer. They're going to, and they can even buy influence without having to be members. No, the way you fight rich people dominating your party is through accountability and democracy. And that's what the leaders of the parliamentary uh, parties hate. And that's what you have to impose is the will of the people in the party on the members. So it's very simple. The more people you have, the more likely you are going to be to be able to impose that on them. I want to make a second point, and that brings us to some specifics here in Canada. There are actually only two countries amongst the former settler colonies that have not created a Labour Party. They are Canada and the USA. The UK created one. There was a traumatic break from the Liberal Party under the hammer blows of the suffragette struggle, the syndicalist struggle, the Irish struggle and the war. In New Zealand, Jacinda Ahern has actually scored some kind of first. She got a majority in a proportional representation. And then she invited the Greens into the cabinet, even though she didn't have to. So go, go Jacinda is my line. The Australians, they don't have a very good Labour Party, but at least they have one. Only the USA has nothing at all. And what Canada has is a kind of surrogate Labour Party. I don't even know if the NDP actually has in its constitution that it seeks to be the party of Labour. I'd like to know whether people will correct me on that. And, and, and if so, how does it propose to be a party of Labour when there are so many people who are clearly travailleurs who are not in it? So I just rem it just reminds me of a discussion I had when I was in Cuba. Um, this guy came up to me on the street. This is a long time ago. And he said, OK, you're, you're, you're clearly English. You could tell. Maybe it was the hat. I don't know. And he said, well, I want to take something up with you. He said, we got rid of our king 
150 years ago and you still have a queen, how can you even talk about socialism? So I would say Canada, even the United Kingdom created a Labour Party 100 years ago. You haven't even got that far. And you're worried about socialism? You know, like so, so, so close to the USA, so far from God, has a different meaning when you go north of the border and well as south of the border. Uh, it's about being part of the, you know, <laughs> part of the archangels. So it's terrible. The third point, it's, it's possible for a previous mass party, and this is where it gets complicated, to have such a terrible program, can't even build a mass base. That's why the social democratic parties of Europe are all collapsing. It's not because they don't have a revolutionary program. It's because they won't even fight for reforms. They were so reactionary, they couldn't even keep their voter base. I don't think that's where we're at in Canada, but it's a risk. If you don't do anything for your base, they'll walk out and they'll join something else. And then we talk about forming new parties. But I don't think that's where they are now. What we see in many countries, however, is new left forces. And we should pay a great deal of the French attention to them. The Linke, France Insoumise, Cinque Stelle, Podemos, all these. There may be many difficulties with them, but they are taking the place of the old social democracy because the old social democracy has, um, you know, basically failed them. It's betrayed them. But, uh, you know, what I would say is the NDP doesn't seem to even made it to the league of being able to betray anything. So it would be a good thing to get there and have a mass party in order to be able to fight within it for a program. Now, that means the dialectic is very complicated. I do not know whether what's going to happen is that, you know, people will just get completely fed up with the NDP. One the minute. NDP, a new, yep, I'm nearly done. A new CCP moment or whatever. What I do know is that what's happening is very big. Waffle at its height had 2,000 members. 12,000 people joined the Green Party to support Dmitry Lascaris. That's a significant social force. There is an equally significant social force in the NDP, and there are probably bigger social forces outside them who are so disgusted with the parliamentary system, they don't even take part in anything. And what you need to do is give these people hope. Give these people hope that you're not going to spend your time fighting each other, but you're going to spend your time fighting their enemies, which means a program that stands for everything that every one of them needs, joining in every struggle, taking every struggle inside your party wherever you are, and working together. Working together for candidates who are of the left. And that's a tactical united front policy which should be followed. We should be having, in my opinion, intimate discussions between the Green left and the NDP left about not just which party we support, but which candidates we support, where you make blocks and so on. And that's, that's why I'm so interested in, in Marianne's proposal. But at the center of that is discussion around what are we fighting for? So I'll finish on that. Thank you so much again. Thank you, Alan. Okay, our next panelist is Mary Ann Cirelli, who is an elf teacher and former NDP member of the Manitoba Legislative Assembly, 1990 to 2003, first in opposition, then in government. Conservative MLAs referred to her as Carla Marx. She moved on to work at the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg and the West Central Women's Resource Centre. She taught politics, education, women's studies at the universities of Winnipeg and Manitoba. At the UW, she led a union drive and then negotiated a first collective agreement for contract faculty. Marianne currently works as a consultant and activist spreading community development for elf, sustainability and peace. She is involved in cleaning up contaminated, site, contaminated sites, stopping the expansion of corporate hog operations, protecting tall grass prairie, and organizing resident groups. Welcome, Marianne. Well, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate the chance to participate in something like this. Um, I'm curious how many people are watching or listening. Um, and uh, I'm... I'm going to pick up on something that 
Alan was talking about just at the end, um, because I agree with Greta Thunberg when it comes to hope. And I, I view hope, um, it's kind of possibly also a Buddhist thing, but I view hope as future oriented. And I'm much more interested in inspiring people to act rather than giving them hope. So I guess the work that uh, we do as activists is we want to inspire people to become activists. We, we want to inspire people to take matters into their own hands, to, um, to uh, you know, be, um, uh, you know, democracy is about uh, people having a say in what happens in their, their community and in their government and in their economy. And um, that's sort of the focus that I, that I would take. And I also agree with Alan when he talks about having a program. And I think part of that program is, um, has to be about politicizing people. So, you know, I, I am still really involved with the NDP. I, uh, live in Leah Gazan's constituency, and I worked really hard to get her nominated and elected and signed up lots of members. And she signed up, you know, a thousand members, I would say, uh, or her campaign did. She she didn't th sign up that many personally. But, um, and uh, I think that we, you know, we have to get back to where political parties actually politicize people. And I've asked that in the NDP is when do we not just canvas and identify vote, but when do we uh, talk about what people's interests are and how their interests are being trampled on and, you know, the, their um, being ignored by governments and, and the corporate sort of, uh, corporate establishment that we have. Um, so the other thing I was going to say in terms of Allen's, you know, I think we have learned the, uh, the lesson and it's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the United States, that they've learned the lesson with Obama that the left and activist movements can't go to sleep once they elect, uh, you know, a democratic government or an NDP government here, that that's the time to work even harder and um, that's the time to make sure that governments aren't just there to keep the other guys out. And when I was in the doer government, I would often say that is we're not just here to keep the other guys out. We have to have the advancing uh, progressive agenda. Um, and, you know, I've spent a lot of time working in community development and doing real grassroots organizing in, you know, or trying to organize transit riders, organizing people who are on social assistance and welfare, organizing people who are workers. And I th think that's what's one of the things that's missing in uh, political parties too, is to really focus on organizing around issues. Um, and I think that's part of the program. So with the NDP right now in Manitoba, um, you know, there's a, real, there's a real lot of room to do some good organizing around health around hydro privatization of hydro and i think around housing there i just wrote a an article of, um, on the perfect storm of, for homelessness that's being created in manitoba by the elimination of the uh, eviction um, moratorium uh, the rising rents and um, the loss of public and social housing We've, we're going to have a lot of people who aren't going to be able to afford housing very soon so that's kind of sort of some comments, I guess, following up what, um, what Alan was talking about. And um, I'm glad to hear you clarify too that a mass party isn't necessarily a new party because I don't think we have time to create a new political party. We have 10 years to advert climate catastrophe and possible collapse. Um, and you know, the time in Manitoba for that would have been 2016 when the NDP imploded, if we're talking provincially. Um, and I think now we have to focus on some of the relationship building that you're talking about and building agreements. Um, so I did raise this, I, I did look at the website for the One Time Alliance, which is proposing a very strategic, they've done the analysis looking at voter turnout um, and they've done the analysis 
you know, looking at um, percentage of vote and um, figured out which seats, you know, could go where and make sure that Greens and NDP are not running against each other. But when I look at it, I actually would see why the NDP wouldn't support this because it's proposing to give the same number of seats to run their own candidate without an opponent from the other side, like from the Greens wouldn't have an opponent from the NDP. And currently the NDP obviously has way more seats, so why would they agree to a program like that? So this has obviously been crafted by the Greens more so I, I look at it. Um, and Riel, um, the fellow that did it, I think is, you know, that, that so that's, it's, it's problematic. Um, so, you know, the NDP does have nationally this Courage Coalition. I've gone to a few of their online meetings and it's kind of interesting, um, you know, to be able to have a movement like the Waffle internally um, is, it's been tried a number of times. I know in Manitoba, we did that after the Sven Robinson campaign. There was, we actually got activists and they took over the executive. Um, the NDP was in opposition at the time. And one of the things is, if we want to have activist political parties, then activists actually have to get up early and do the political work and go to the meetings, you know, do the budget stuff, do the grunt work. And that's one of the things, you know, it's not all just policy. There, there is a lot of organization. And I happen to believe political parties can be both election machines, which you need to win, but they can also have principles and a, and a, and a radicalized platform um, because that's what we need. The, the reality of the world is demanding that we need a more uh, radicalized platform in the sense that um, not tinkering, like we have to make bold steps uh, to address the crises in equity and the economy and the crisis in, in uh, climate. So I was going to talk a little bit about, um, you know, why I'm still in the NDP and sort of some of my experience with trying to uh, do the kind of organizing and democratizing of the party because under, uh, you know, Gary Dewar was there for a number of years and there really was a centralization of power. And there was an article in the Free Press in 95 when we lost the election in Manitoba and it said if Gary Dewar ever wants to be premier, he has, he has to deal with the left of his party. And that that's what they did. And it's some of those same people are now working in BC. They're working in the federal offices in Ottawa for the NDP. And um, it, it's the difference between an activist party and a more bureaucratic party that's about, you know, winning elections and not, um, you know, focusing on sort of some tinkering kind of policies and, and not really transforming um, injustice in the economy. So, um, you know, I've, I'm talking a lot now about the supremacist agenda. I think the movement around Black Lives Matter and defunding the police are really important, but we have to be more strategic in how we get those movements to talk to each other. So I'm part of a conference in Winnipeg next week, organized uh, called move, about movement weaving and actually talking about how do we get the labor movement to talk to the environmental movement and the indigenous movement and the youth movement and in other parts of the world, I haven't done a lot of international travel. I've never been to Venezuela or, uh, you know, some of these these places that have, I think, a much stronger connection between their social movements and their elected, uh, you know, their par political parties that are running in elections. And I think that that's something that we're missing here. And there, 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 we need to create the structures for that um, discussion between the labor movements, the environment movement. And I often describe my politics as green labor, you could say eco socialist. You know, the word socialist still terrifies people and it gets used. You know, I was red baited a lot when I was an MLA. I don't consider myself a Marxist, but, um, you know, people, uh, uh, I, language does, does, is important. So the idea though of green labor is that union workers and workers generally need to be at the forefront of organizing around the climate justice movement and um, thinking of ourselves not just as consumers in the fight on on climate but to think of ourselves as workers and economic actors as workers in in 
the the climate fight. So I've I've got a whole program on green labor that I don't have time to get into now. But I also really think that the work that Jane McAlevey's done on distributive organizing is really instructive and helpful. And I use that in the work that I do. Um, I just finished doing a, a project for a year and a half with United Food and Commercial Workers, doing internal organizing with one of their um, member member employee groups. And you know, a lot of a lot of union members don't even know why they're part of a union. They don't know what the union does. Like, there's just a huge amount of work that the labor movement has to do with its own membership besides the general public, um, and that's part of that politicization. Um, so. You know, I'm also very concerned about patriarchy on the left. And I think a lot of the tools I have on my website, something called ban the panel, because I think I've gone to so many panels, especially because of COVID, where they have all these great speakers and they have all these people and nothing comes of it. It's like talking heads and that could happen tonight. And there's no organizing that comes out of it. So the work that I do in the community as an organizer is saying, if we're gonna have all these brains in the room, or talking together, let's take it somewhere. Let's let's do some organizing, and um, you know the the uh, I think we we use a lot of the corporate and the the colonial uh, methods for having meetings and you know doing organizing. And I, as a as a, a feminist, I'm I mean I'm really concerned about that. I think that we don't really know how to share power often and collaborate. And, um, you know, uh, so some of the work that I'm doing now really is working at my very neighborhood level and trying to bring this eco justice uh, agenda to our local neighborhood with the residents association. So, you know, like I said, in the, the email exchange we had, it's about being uh, an eco socialist in the real world, working with real people and you know what I've seen oftentimes is there's these little groups that get started um, that only talk to each other. And um, I'm I kind of decided uh, recently that I'm going to work in the community in my neighborhood and trying to organize people. So we we just had an amazing meeting this week, uh, organizing with a bunch of neighborhoods to protect the urban forest in in Winnipeg, which is being decimated. So. It's not necessarily revolutionary work. It is kind of trying to make that connection between progressive policy on the one hand and organizing uh, on issues on the other hand and getting really skilled at how we develop campaigns and build public support so that we can we can win on some of these issues. Um, also really concerned what's happening with our uh, local city council here in Winnipeg. So we're doing some organizing around the city budget to try and make sure the budget actually funds the policy. You know, we work so hard. They hire all these consultants. They have all these meetings. We develop all this policy and then the budget just funds police and roads and urban sprawl and uh, services are cut. So um you know, I I uh, I guess I could bring it back to the idea then of how do we organize into this kind of a political movement that comes from the grassroots, comes from movements, and translates that into electoral power. And that's the that's the conversation I really think we need to be having, and to actually make a plan to um, bring. So the diff various movements together. And um, I think I'll leave it at that for now and uh, see what other people have to say. Okay, thank you very much, Marianne. Our next panelist is Gary Porter. He joined the League for Socialist Action at the age of 19 and was active during the Black Freedom Movement the Vietnam anti-war movement, the women's liberation movement, and the gay liberation movement. He was a member of CUPE, Local 79 in Toronto. As a certified general accountant and chartered accountant, Gary served on the executive of both the Ontario and Canada top CA bodies. 
He was a union appointee to the Board of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan and chair of the investment committee that managed his $105 billion fund. During that time, he met many of the major capitalists in Canada, including Ken Thompson, Michael Murnau, Michael McCain, and Jerry Swartz. He is now organizer of the British Columbia branch of Socialist Action and a member of the SA Central Committee. Welcome, Gary. Thank you, uh, Comrade Chair. <clears throat> I, d I have not been able to bring a caucus of chartered accountants with me to the revolutionary movement. Uh, I'm not sure anybody's going to be surprised by that. Um, listening to the comments of uh, Alan and Mary Ann, they're, they're very rich, and uh, there's a lot that I agree with, some things I don't. Uh, and I think probably the most efficient way, given 15 minutes, is to say what, what I think. Um, uh, I'll start by saying that uh, I am a member of the uh, vice president of my federal NDP riding, and um, we have decided to carry on educationals as well as uh, electoral activities. We just had a seminar on systemic racism, and uh, at our next executive meeting, we're discussing a resolution to protest Randall Garrison's uh, pro Zionist uh, policies, which is. Um, his, his support for uh, his opposition to BDS and his support for the um, uh, Holocaust uh, Remembrance Association's definition of anti Semitism, which is just basically trying to kill free speech around criticism of uh, Israeli apartheid. Um, so uh, we are trying to uh, take on some of the horrible uh, actions. Uh, he also, of course, on the Liberals came forward with their vast military, 70% military budget increase, said that he thought it wasn't enough. So um, uh, I personally think he should be in the Conservative Party. But in any case, uh, let me start on uh, my talk. Um, the core of any strategy to build a revolutionary leadership in Canada, and I must agree with Alan, I am a revolutionary socialist, to build a revolutionary leadership in Canada as part of a revolutionary international is an unambiguous orientation to the working class. And by working class, I mean those who are forced to sell their labor in order to live. So that broader definition that Alan talked about. A clear understanding of classes and class lines is the only way to avoid confusion, illusion, and betrayal. For me, the term people does that. It, uh, it, it blurs the distinction the uh, clarity that's needed to understand the special role of the working class. Um, but the two main classes in Canada today remain the ruling capitalist class and the working class composed of all those who, as I say, must, uh, by whatever contractual means, sell their labor to live. And we know that that's, uh, the gig economy and all these so-called contract workers and so on has uh, undermined the uh, solidarity of workers or the easy solidarity of workers. In Canada today, apart from the tiny revolutionary organizations, and SA is, is a tiny organization, um, all political parties have electoral and uh, pro-capitalist um, attributes. This includes the Green Party and the NDP, <clears throat> which seek nothing more than to reform capitalism. <clears throat> The, the critical distinction between these two parties is that the NDP was formed by a merger of the CCF, an agrarian-based uh, social democratic organization, and the Canadian Labour Congress, uh, which represented at the time uh, something close to 80% of all labour. The, the only major labour organization outside of it was the, was the um, Confederation Nationale de Trivier in, in uh, Montreal, in Quebec. <clears throat> Um, and it continues to have most of that base. If you attend Labor Council meetings, as uh, one of our uh, members here is the chair of the of the large, third largest Labor Council in Canada, uh, or NDP Council meetings, what you find is, is there's a very considerable overlap uh, between the social democratic and labor bureaucrats, the leadership of, of the two parties. And it's not by accident that unions don't know what they're uh, what their uh, unions are for because the labor bureaucracy 
tries to act as if it's they that negotiate contracts. Uh, and it's really the threat of the masses behind them that makes the bosses concede anything. And uh, the same with the NDP. The most important people are the members of legislatures, and uh, you can't do anything to hurt their chances. What they really are is uh, left, left, slightly left-leaning careerists um, and uh, not leaders of anything, any form of mass action. The Green Party has a petty bourgeois base uh, and exactly zero union affiliates. So the Green Party, uh, whose leadership is pro-Zionist, anti-abortion, advocates a fake capitalist green plan, um, and uh, who, when pushed, easily becomes anti-labor, has no saving graces. It is simply a capitalist party in all respects. Supporting the Green Party, in my opinion, crosses class lines and is a betrayal to all who follow you. I do not, I do not say that all Green Party members are pro-capitalist, although many, in fact, the majority are, as the recent election showed. But many see themselves as eco-socialists, although they clearly do not grasp the question of class, nor the fundamental or irreconcilable struggle between the working class and its capitalist enemy. If they did, they would not be in the Green Party. But many uh, are anti-capitalist and definite candidates for revolutionary socialism. Dmitry Lascaris' recent GP uh, leadership campaign ran on what, uh, having read the entire detailed program more than once, I characterize as a left social democratic platform. It did not really discuss social classes and was written entirely in the context of the capitalist state. If you implemented all of it, you would still have capitalism. Never posing a workers' government or workers' power, even in its detailed and fairly substantial version, still available on uh, Dimitri's website. While current agitational slogans are often limited to specific reforms or rights, as they should be, uh, a principled, detailed program must clearly state your long-term goals. In Dimitri's case, this is a chimera of a deeply changed capitalist state where human need triumphs over greed and profit motive. This is wishful thinking. This will never happen. And because of the uh, essential nature of capitalism, cannot happen anywhere ever. These limitations are made all the more curious because Dimitri at the time was a member of Socialist Action, a revolutionary socialist organization based on the theories, analysis, and, and traditions of Marx and Lenin. The campaign led thousands of militants, mostly youth, into a capitalist party on a left social democratic program. But I say did understand the potential of Dimitri could convince, could be convinced to lead many, if not most, of the uh, out of the capitalist dead end of the Green Party and in a direction towards a truly significant socialist organization oriented from the beginning to the working class. Such an organization would attract many left-wingers in the NDP and inspire new layers uh, to the flag of revolutionary wor working class politics. So far, Dimitri has chosen to carry out a bureaucratic fight inside the Green Party, even to support its pro-capitalist candidates. Liz May and Emily Paul are very class conscious. They support capitalism and they are anti-labor. Let me be clear, Dimitri is a courageous militant on the issues such as fighting Israel apartheid and many other issues as well. But he is misleading and betraying his followers by, by constraining them to a reformist program and an intra-bureaucratic and tedious struggle in, the, in a capitalist party. In the end, if he persists, he will either compromise with the pro-capitalist leadership or be expelled as a defeated minority. In either case, the capitalist nature of the Green Party will remain unchanged. I cannot think of a single case where a capitalist party has been turned into a workers' party. Our proposal, presented in an open letter immediately after the Green Party leadership race, remains the clearest anti-capitalist and socialist alternative. This is, and I'm going to just state here what we said in that proposal. Dimitri, you engaged, uh, you waged an amazing campaign that rallied thousands of people to echo socialist ideas. That is a testament to your consummate skills as a superb organizer and an articulate proponent of radical socioeconomic change. 
At the, in the end, the Green Party selected one of the most conservative pro-capitalist candidates who contended to be its next leader. In her post-victory statement and in interviews with the mass media, Emily Paul, an, an, sorry, Annemie Paul emphasized her identity and her personal zeal for politics instead of highlighting her policies. This is likely because her ideas conform to the tired old GP outlook on private ownership of the economy and regulating capitalism to eliminate uh, carbon production instead of of uh, national of uh, socializing the industry and uh, overthrowing the capitalist state. Not to mention it's somewhat mixed up, mixed but general support for Ottawa's pro-imperialist foreign policy. Paul, a liberal-minded civil liberties lawyer, won with 12,000 votes to your 10,081 votes after eight rounds of ballot counting. The result highlights the sharp divide in the Green Party between left and right. The magnitude of the left vote reflects the global mass radicalization, especially of young workers, stemming from combined economic, health, and environmental crises of late capitalism. The gap between enemy Paul and you in policy terms seems huge. Moreover, in, in, at one stage in the leadership race, Paul stated that you should not be allowed to remain in the contest. She denounced your position on Palestine as redolent of anti-Semitism, a trope of the Zionist apartheid camp in world politics. <coughs> Excuse me. Socialist Action believes that the pro-capitalist policies are a toxic dead end. The election of Paul reaffirms the pro-capitalist character of the Green Party of Canada. It will never be a socialist nor a serious uh, ecological working class or working class party. The working class, in order to rescue humanity and the environment from the imminent global capitalist catastrophe, requires a revolutionary socialist party to help to organize and lead the fundamental change, which is so urgently necessary. What is to be done now? Dimitri, I respectfully submit that you should not squander what your energetic campaign accomplished by saying staying in the Green Party and by serving as a loyal opposition to pro-capitalist leaders. The embattled, uh, ethically challenged establishment within the Green Party. They will exert every effort to control and to mute you. It's hard to imagine, for example, how you can care, continue to lead your work in the disruption network while remaining a, a prominent member of the bourgeois electoral GPC. Now is the time to call in your radical support base to have the to leave the bourgeois green party and join in the construction of a genuine revolutionary socialist organization this can be done by appealing in concert with socialist action and others to the most progressive sections of the labor movement and to the radical socialist public together let's host a big conference to discuss how to launch a revolutionary eco-socialist workers party what do you say that remains the question to all eco-socialists, what do you say? In the meantime, we are prepared to work as part of United Fronts with any group of workers or especially oppressed groups to defend our rights, extend our gains anytime, anywhere. We are currently proposing United Front municipal campaigns based on a worker's agenda. Two more questions. Does the Canadian working class retain its revolutionary potential in terms of its economic position and weight in Canadian society? And how will Canadian workers move from mostly reform consciousness towards revolutionary consciousness? I think these are critical questions in the minds of ra radical young workers and students in Canada who have begun to think in terms of social revolution or start considering uh, socialism or even Marxism. My answers are yes to the first question. The working class in Russia was only 20% of the population in 1917, and they managed to lead the peasants, uh, first of all, they permeated the army, which was constructed chiefly of peasants, and won it over, and then uh, won, won over the peasants to support them with the assistance of the left social revolutionaries uh, in the path to revolution. On a global basis and in Canada, the proletariat has been increasing ever since that time. To this day, petty bourgeois layers, academics, professionals, small shopkeepers, and small farmers are being forced down into the working class. Tenured academics become contract teachers. Small farmers become agricultural laborers and global agri-corps. Small shopkeepers become employees in retail chains. 
And it remains the case today that when workers strike, production ceases. In a general strike, profits cease. The workers retain that their strategic, strategic position and they know how to both stop production and to run it without the bosses, although much more could be said and needs to be said on that score. On the second point, it is critical to understand that revolutionaries do not spark revolutions. The contradictions of capitalism and the mass suffering that they cause is what sparks. One minute, Gary. Sorry? One minute. Okay, I've got one minute to go. Revolutionary uprisings. Workers do not easily move en masse towards overthrowing the whole system. They are generally defensive in their consciousness and reformist. Workers move towards systemic opposition when they see no alternative. It is at this point that revolutionary vanguard is utterly decisive, explaining to the mass of workers the meaning of daily events and tactics of the struggle today and tomorrow, sometimes defensive and consolidating, sometimes advancing uh, until power passes into their hands. These are rich areas of critical education for young radicalizing students and workers. And there is much more to say on these subjects. Perhaps we can hold a webinar with a title, something like in defense of the revolutionary potential of the working class in Canada. In fact, I'm considering writing something extensive on that in the near future. Thank you all very much. Okay, thank you, Gary. So now we're going to go to our producer, Kurt Young. And he will uh, put forward uh, three questions, and and each uh, a participant will have up to four minutes to answer one, two, or three. It's up to you. And the lineup will be Marianne will be first, then Gary, and then Alan. Okay, Kurt, we'll go to you for the questions. You will find them in the chat as well. Okay. So our first question comes from Dustin Brown. He asks. Do the guests have experience building solidarity between revolutionary organizations and indigenous sovereignty movements? Any reflections on how solidarity may differ from bourgeois reconciliation? Very wise letter asks, eco-socialism eco is a program with revolutionary implications because it involves expropriation of big oil and gas and big capital generally. To win workers to such a program requires a disciplined organization to advocate it tirelessly. In the mass workers' organizations like unions and the NDP, not in liberal or green capitalist parties, build such an eco-socialist uh, organization, if not now. And I believe that's a question, the way he posed it, I, uh, he used, it was from a lack of space in the chat. Um, and then the last question is from myself. And I ask, how do we break the multi-generation long conditioning of the masses that lead them to believe that voting is sufficient in changing society and that nothing more will be required of them? Okay, so you each have up to four minutes to answer uh, whichever questions you want. And we will start with Marianne. There we go, unmuted. Um, I think I'll start with the last one because I was talking about this a little bit. And we do have uh, a generation coming up that are activists that are, you know, spending a lot of their time learning about issues, organizing, um, you know, doing these protests. And I, so I think culturally there is something that, um, you know, I think that happened in other generations as well. Um, but I, I, we need organizations that are going to support that, that are going to, um, you know, bring the, the, uh, the best strategies and, and ways of organizing um, forward and, um, you know, that people, and I think that people need to have the movements learning from each other. And, um, I guess I'm, I, I'm, when, when you talk about sort of a revolutionary, um, agenda and, and, you know, this, there's going to be some, um, mass takeover of private, especially in the extraction industries, 
um, you know, that may happen as green energies, I don't know if green energies are, are green energy is being controlled in the same, by the same private kind of companies as oil and gas was. So um, I'm not sure how you're going to, to do that other than, you know, it, like the, the federal government bought the pipeline, but is that, is that going to be a way to sort of take over these assets when really we want, we want them to transition to green energy? Um, so, and I think the other important question is, um, to do with the relationship with Indigenous communities. And, uh, I think there also is a radical element. I was just on a webinar earlier, uh, today, um, with Pam Palmiter and, um, what's her name from the States. And, you know, they, they, they're talking about, um, revolution in the way of returning their land to, you know, self-governing nations of indigenous nations. And that, I think it's being in support of that. Um, and, and again, I think young people that are doing organizing now also really understand that. And like some of you have said, we, we can't, um, be in support of, a. a a justice agenda without supporting First Nations and Indigenous rights to uh, control their territory. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? Supporting Indigenous rights is uh, the fundamental line of march for me is uh, self-determination for Indigenous people. I think if we look to the UNDRIP program, the United Nations uh, Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, it talks extensively about self-determination. Self-determination includes the right to say no, no pipelines, no mines, nothing, unless we say so. So, because <clears throat> right now, the, it's the will of those corporations and, their, and the governments that back them, the capitalist state, which is organized to defend the uh, collective interests of the ruling class. So, um, uh, First of all, we have to recognize that, uh, just, uh, for me, support for Indigenous people means they have the right over their land. Uh, it also means returning their lands. So um, I'm not afraid of that. I mean, some people are, well, God, they'll take my home. Um, you know, you have to pay up what you owe. <laughs> anyway, um, in the uh, huge struggle of supporting the Wet'suwet'en, um, against the uh, the uh, pipeline, uh, LNG pipeline, uh, coastal gas link. Uh, thousands and thousands of young people of all races came out to support the indigenous people. So action was very much among them. Um, and uh, uh, that's the easiest way to make a link is to show in action, in solidarity actions, that you're with them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we participated in those and we're quite happy to participate, even eager to participate in, in solidarity actions in the future. I have been in touch with some of the indigenous bands around me, uh, um, which are Saanich speaking peoples on Vancouver Island. Um, and uh, they're very open people. I mean, if you're willing to help, that's fine. Um, I wanted to say... Uh, The TMX pipeline takeover is a good good uh, uh, way to see the role of capitalist state. It is, a among other things, it is a guarantor of private profit by absorbing uh, and passing on to the working class private losses. They, they do that by two things. First of all, they allow the deduction of losses from income tax. Uh, but the second thing is they sometimes just take over the losses. Uh, Trudeau it was motivated here by Morno, who is uh, in his own life is a massive billionaire venture capitalist who likes to do public-private partnerships, and that usually means the public pays and the private and the private part profits, uh, and that's what this is. He was attempting to rescue his buddies from Enron, who are running uh, uh, the name escapes me. What's the name of the corporation um, that they bought it from? Anyway, um, he, um, 
he uh, their shareholders made a fortune and uh, the uh, auditor general said that he paid at least twice what the pipeline was worth of course to us, us it's worthless because it's 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 a, a killing infrastructure killing our environment uh, and the NDP for their part here in BC fought it through the court but of course made no mention of mass action of stopping the pipeline physically uh, they don't do that. Uh, so uh, the NDP has given up that struggle and we're trying to get them to pick it up again. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just leave it there. Okay, thank you. Okay, Alan? I want to focus on the first question uh, and say a little bit about the other two. But if I run out of time, I'll just do the first one, no disrespect. Um, I uh, had the privilege of going with Peter Kulczycki, who is one of the foremost uh, activists and Marxists struggling for indigenous rights in uh, Northern Manitoba, on a visit which took uh, five days. And we visited uh, most of the major sites people are affected by hydro. Split Lake, Cross Lake, South India Lake, Norway House. And we listened to the leaders and we listened to the people, and we listened to what they had to say. I profoundly disagree, and I'm sorry about this, with the idea that what you have to do is go and organize people. Don't agree with it. Sorry, but I'm gonna be blunt. And I was trade union president of the union in, in, in the Greater London Authority, and it was a big battle, despite the guy who was the mayor. And the membership under me went up from 200 to uh, 520. Because we went out and we said to people, what do you want? And the problem with the left is it doesn't ask people what they want. Organizing, people organize themselves. What you have to do is respect what they have to say. The number of people who have told me that when 12,000 kids came out against climate change, with Greta Theobon as their idol, that she was a bourgeois, Norwegian, paid off little what's it, and so we should pay no attention to her. I despair. There were 12,000 young kids coming out there, and you should have, I have pictures of the posters that they were carrying, and there was no doubt of their sentiment and their spirit. And people don't listen to the indigenous people. They have all kinds of wonderful ideas, and they go out and they try and teach them. Let me tell you something. Hydro is the crown in the NDP's jewel. And I'm sorry to say this, it's a settler colonial enterprise which is destroying the natural habitat of the North and is destroying the well-being of the indigenous people. And it has betrayed them because the Northern Flood Agreement, which was conducted in 1972, guaranteed that they would have a livelihood and they would have a living. And in 1975, the people of South India Lake were selling more fish on the New York markets than any of the fishermen on the lakes of Winnipeg who have a complete monopoly over it and exclude the indigenous people. You don't find that out if you don't go talk to people. You don't find out about apple pie islands or lakes that are polluted and it's impossible, which used to be clear and you can't swim in or trap lines that you can't manage because you don't talk to people and find out what they themselves are doing. And I was humiliated. I was humiliated when I went and I found what those people have been put through by the NDP, by the NDP, not because it's a bourgeois party. Of course, it's a damn bourgeois party. They're all bourgeois parties. I mean, for God's sake, anything, Gary, that you say about the Greens applies to the NDP. So what? I would actually be very happy if the NDP would only adopt a left social democratic program. That would be a big step forward, right? So I'm not unhappy about the Green, you know, Dimitri Lascaris having on to a many less social democratic programs is my line. The problem is people don't do what they promise. When I work for Ken, the difference between Ken Livingston and every 30 other- 30 seconds. He says, I will do what I will promise. I will not promise more than I can do. And what I do, I will promise. And Ben was the same. That's the character of politicians that we need to do two things. Listen to people, help them organize, respect them, understand them, spread understanding about their condition to other people who are in struggle, get them talking to each other, 
make realistic things from it. Not, not revolution, say, I will solve the problem of what is happening to your, your land now. I will solve it. And I will stick to my damn promises. We concluded the Northern Flood Agreement. If only the politicians had simply done what they promised, you would now be in a totally different relation between the workers' movement in Manitoba and the indigenous people of Manitoba. So that's my answer. And on the last question about people who think voting is sufficient, I honestly think the problem is that most people don't vote. The, the, only a minority of people under 21 in America voted in the elections at all. Why? Because they've seen what the politicians do. They have confidence in the parliamentary system. So the first thing you need is politicians who will actually show it's worth being involved in the parliamentary system at all. And if they do that, they won't just go in in order to say, you know, I'm going to stick around. And I'm glad I'm it's only rich people who can afford that. People who have real issues, they go in and say, I'm damn well going to hold the feet to the fire of the people I vote for. And I'm not even bothering with your party unless you let me do that. So anyway. Thank you, Alan. OK, so uh, we're going to go to three more questions. And and the lineup will be uh, um, Gary, Alan, and Marianne, and we have up to four minutes. Kurt. Okay, uh, give me one moment as I'm organizing this. All right. So our first question comes from Dinner with Franklin, and he asks. Are there any groups that seem more receptive to working together? Our second question comes from Rosemary, uh, and she asks, Alan, does Dimitri Lascaris have a plan for what to do with the almost 50% of Green Party members who supported him? Is he going to fight for the element of his program which you helped to write to be championed and put forward in their public campaigns? Elizabeth uh, Bice states, asks, Socialist Action is the most avid promoter of the United Front on the Left. Initiatives for mass housing construction, free transit, socialist municipal election coalitions, Palestine and Venezuela solidarity action, the NDP Socialist Caucus and the Workers' Action Movement to fight for class struggle, unionism, and leadership. Who are the best partners for actions on such issues? Okay, so you have up to four minutes to answer one, two, or three, or pass. And we will uh, start with uh, Gary, then Alan, and then Marianne. Well, I think on the last question, the best partners are the ones that respond to uh, invitations. <laughs> I think we uh, we try as, as we try to go as widely as possible. We seek support from uh, from uh, New Democrats, and uh, we have a green you know if there's green people that want to support it, that's fine. Uh, because it's the United Front is around specific issues, uh, and uh, you know anybody who wants to participate is fine. So, uh, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, Socialist Action it does do a lot of work trying to bring people together, um, and uh, it's not uh, so. Um, And the United Front is a good strategy because it doesn't mean that you have to agree up front on everything. I think the thing that uh, I, the thing that worries me about what Alan's proposing is that uh, caucuses and the NDP and the Green Party and other organizations try to work together is that you, know, you, you, you get into a fairly endless discussion right away. And I've seen this happen recently in Vancouver um, of your differences instead of your similarities. Um, uh, because, you know, on almost every question, there's a difference between what uh, each of the groups brings to the party, if you'll pardon the pun, and uh, how that should be interpreted. So if you try to organize a, a, a front around one or two specific issues, then um, you have a better sh a better chance. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if Alan could explain how he sees these caucuses coming together. Or is it really what he's promoting as a united front on specific actions of people from the different groups? And I, 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 I understand that. Uh, that that to me makes more sense. Um, on the question of um, mass motion, 
there's really two processes going on. There's the capitalist uh, democratic party, and I'm not talking here about a capitalist labor party. I'm talking about a straight up capitalist party that is perhaps more warmongering than the Republicans. Um, <clears throat> was the initiator of the ring, iron ring around uh, Russia and uh, the initiator of the pivot to the Pacific, um, which is really just an anti-Chinese uh, um, you know, strategy. Um, but, it's, but then outside of that was the mass movement, the Black Lives Matter, which involved by some estimates as many as 20 or 25 million different people in the midst of a pandemic. Now that's that's that was serious. Of course, it has no it had no leadership. It had no uh, program, so uh, it it fell back, and the Democrats were able to stream a large part of it into uh, into their election campaign. But the other thing, of course, was that a large part of it didn't vote, and it simply emerged in the streets. It was a wonderful uh, movement, but uh, it ebbs back, and the police are now more militant than ever. In Vancouver, for example, the city asked the police to cut their budget by 1%, as all other departments in the city were doing, and the police refused. Uh, they set up, the, the Vancouver government said uh, they wanted to substitute some police work with social action and involving community participants in helping to solve their own problems and helping to fund those. And the police set up a new unit, which is a bashing the poor unit. What 30 this, uh, seconds. Which what this does is, you know, you can call that unit if uh, you have a homeless person on your doorstep, and that person will be removed and shuffled off out of sight, that sort of thing. So, you know, now you've got a situation where the police are even worse. Um, and uh, there's developing a movement in Vancouver, small to begin with, for actually more seriously defunding the police. And also a, a new demand, citizens control over the police that the province should give up control over the police and turn it over to the people of Vancouver and their elected representatives. And then the city council would actually have the authority to cut the police if they want. But to have armed, uniformed forces that can operate outside the uh, uh, control of the elected representatives is uh, should no longer be tolerable, if it ever was. Uh, Thank I'll you, start. Gary. Okay. Alan? Um, I love the way everybody gets animated when they're talking about struggle. And it goes downhill when you start talking about each other. And that's the problem. Okay. There's something inspiring about people who just get together and say, I am fighting for my rights. I'm fighting for justice. I'm fighting this because I believe in it. And I've seen completely ordinary people. We've all seen it. With, with no formal training in Trotskyism or, or Marxism or whatever, just say, this is right, and I'm fighting for it. And I think the very first thing you have to do is when people say, I want this, and if it's not actually counter-revolutionary or attacking somebody else, you know, when fascist gets up and says, I, I want to kick out all the black people, you say, no, no I'm going to kick you out, right? But when people fight for something that's right and is compatible with the rights of everybody else, I'm going to fight for it, I'm going to help you. I'm going to work with you to make that happen. So I'm very puzzled by Rosemary's question. I think it's just a classic question. Um, Dimitri is not going to do anything with the 50%. The 50% are going to do something with Dimitri. You know, get it the right way around. It's the struggle that determines what the leaders do, not the leaders that determine how they think the struggle should run. And this is, this is, this is a frame of mind of the left that one just has to get out of. This is a movement which is much bigger than any of us ever expected. The, the, you, you cannot believe the inspiration, the enthusiasm of people from so many different backgrounds, so many different perspectives, coming together and endorsing and agreeing on such a wide range of issues. And what has to be done with that is to say this was a tremendous thing. I think it expresses a real sentiment in the country. I think it's much more than 12,000 people. And we want to reach out and find ways that the other 100,000 people, at least in Canada, who agree with that, can find a way to act. Now, the parliament, the problem with the parliamentary system and uh, everything that we have now is it doesn't have a way for them to act. If you speak up in the NDP, if you speak up in the Greens, you're shut down. 
because the parliamentary struggle dominates. That doesn't mean you shouldn't be in there fighting for it, but the question is how do you impose the needs of the struggle on what the parliamentary representatives do? And for me, that has always been the way I've organized. It's very effective, it's very inspiring. And when you find a politician that really responds and really says, yes, I'm gonna do this. And I think Dimitri is one of those. Um, it's worth a thousand tomes of Marxist writings because it's somebody who means what they say. So I'm just gonna say one thing then um, on, on, on dinner with Franklin. Well, I think Manitoba I find pretty good. I mean, the atmosphere in Manitoba, maybe because we got left behind, is just that people actually work together very effectively. You know, I've worked with Marianne, I've worked with people in the Venezuela campaign. People can't afford the luxury of fighting each other, or at least uh, the only people who have that luxury are the right of the NDP when they, you know, conspire to 30 kick, seconds. kick out the left. So um, you have to find, uh, I don't know whether that can be replicated, but there are places, there are um, refuges where you can actually work together. And I would say when you find one place you work together, build out of where you work together, say, how do we manage to do it there? Let's do it somewhere else. And the last point is I deeply respect socialist action for the fact they do have a united front policy. I think that's true. I've worked with Barry on Venezuela and I would encourage the discussion is all I can say around Elizabeth's question, because I think it's true. You are avid promoters of the united front. Uh, so I just encourage the widest possible discussion around two things. One, what do you want United Fronts on? And that brings us back to the program. What do you disagree with in the program? What should be added? What's wrong? What should be taken out? Tell us, say, let's have a discussion about that. Then when we know what we agree on, we'll say, who's fighting for that? Is somebody fighting for that? Oh, we can see somebody. We found so many movements in the course of forging that campaign. It was done in dialogue with many movements, the climate change movement, indigenous people, uh, justice movements, and so on. A workers' movement, Sid Ryan from the, you know, he, he was part of the discussion on the UBI and workers' rights and all the rest of it. So it's not Please true. Please wrap up, unions. Alan. Not true, the trade unions had no input. They had a big input. And what we want is that to go wider. So if, if socialist action, really wants to pursue a united front, you tell us how you think that you can work with us to achieve the aims that we agree on. Thank you. Uh, Marianne? Unmute yourself. There we go. That worked. I, I want to go back to something I thought of after for the first question from the last group where we were talking about Indigenous uh, self-government and sovereignty. And I actually did a project about a year ago with Treaty 3, which is two First Nations in um, Manitoba on the east side of the province, and then 26 uh, communities in Ontario up towards Thunder Bay. And they are involved in uh, a project discussions with the federal government around the health transformation agenda, which is transferring uh, authority for health care back to First Nations communities that will come with giving them funding and a allowing them to integrate their traditional cultural practices around health with um, Western medicine. So this is something that, you know, um, has been going on across country in all treaty areas and I'm sure it's going on in BC and other areas as well. Um, NBC actually has a model that's quite advanced. Um, so I think this is an example that could be, you know, looked at in other areas. But what was really interesting was talking about how to connect economic development back with health and how in First Nations, you know, in, in Indigenous culture, the, the idea that, um, that we're part of nature, that we're, that we're connected to the land and that our health comes from the, a healthy environment and integrating the, the, econo the economic development of that, uh, you know, and then a continuum into healthcare. So um, I, I just think it's a, it is one area that you can know the same thing is happening in education, the same thing is happening in child services. Um, there's, different examples even in corrections now with um, 
in Manitoba, uh, groups of um, mostly indigenous men who have been in prison, now creating a, a circle around people who ha are being, um, are coming out of prison to make sure that they have support and they can transition into the community in a good way. So I, I think that those are some of the kind of things that um, we can look at. In terms of um, the other uh, questions in the second group, um, there's a, a couple of organizations in the United States. One is called uh, Rank and File, and one is called um, Labor Notes, that I don't know that we have anything like that in Canada, where there are uh, activists who want to see an activist labor movement, they want to see a more radical agenda in the labor movement, are working and pushing uh, that agenda into unions. And I think we have to make sure that the labor movement isn't just a creature of capital, capitalism that isn't just concerned about uh, negotiating, you know, increases in pay, and there isn't any kind of organization of members, there isn't any political action. Um, and and, I, and so I, I think that a lot of the work that we have to do is in the labor movement. Um, if we're going to talk about, you know, the relationship between the labor movement and political, political parties. So I really agree with what um, you were saying earlier, um, Gary, about uh, the Green Party, you know, not understanding the labor movement, wanting really probably nothing to do with the labor movement. 30 seconds. That, that's, I think, really important. In terms of the second question in this group, I think internal democracy in every party is a problem. So, um, you know, the way that money works in nominations, the way that um, the election of, of executives work isn't that democratic, it's by a slate. Um, and, you know, so there, there's a lot of us in, in the NDP that are trying to democratize the party uh, to make it um, more of a place where you can actually do activism and organizing. Thank and you. Then, um, I have some notes here about the first question too. What did I say? If you could wrap up though, we're running out of time. Yeah, I'll leave it there then. I, I do just say that, you know, we have to get activists selected. I mean, AOC, uh, the, the whole squad in the United States, people like Leah Gazan, um, when, when you can be a political activist and be elected, and that's what I did for 13 years, I just saw myself as an activist who happened to be elected, and you can get a lot done by bringing the community into the discussion and bringing the community into the halls of power, so to speak, so. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we're going to go back to our producer. We have two questions left. And uh, you will have up to, 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 we'll probably go a little over time, I hope not. Uh, three minutes each to answer. And please, comrades, I want you to stick to the three minutes, please. And the lineup will be Alan, Marianne, and Gary. So the two questions, Kurt. All right, our first question comes from Julius. He asks, if there is no time to create a new eco-socialist party, then doesn't it make sense to work in the existing Labour Party, the NDP, and fight for eco-socialism and the defense of oppressed people there, along with our allies and unions? And our second question comes from Dustin Brown. With the CLC pushing to a bat, uh, uh, pushing to back, uh, oh, CLC pushing a back to work agenda through the whole pandemic, endorsing Bill Morneau to lead the OEC oh, yeah. and refusing to investigate strike, uh, instigate strike action. Where do we find revolutionary workers? Yeah. Okay, Alan, and then Marianne, and then Gary. So Kurt asked me to mention, because I posted some links um, to some of the texts that I was talking about, and uh, He's asked me to mention that that information is located in the description. Um, I think that the question of time is rather a difficult one. If there really is no time, then it depends whether people realize there's no time or not. If they don't realize it, okay, we're all dead, so let's you know um, enjoy life while we may. If people start to realize the urgency of the situation, and they realize just how frustrating the situation is, then you'll move into a revolutionary situation because people will say, well, I can't wait for Parliament. You know, I have to do something. Um, but that's the task of creating a revolutionary party. Not the same as creating a mass labor party. 
for a mass party. In I, I think you it's it's worthwhile studying revolutions and seeing what actually happens because yeah. in revolutions there's a sudden rapid radicalization of huge masses of people like the Iranian Revolution or the Mexican Revolution because not all revolutions are socialist. You have to remember that. Yeah. Um, and it's that explosion that creates the revolutionary movement. So that brings me to the second question. Um, I, I don't think there are many revolutionary workers. I mean, because it's not a revolutionary situation. Revolution, people come to revolutionary consciousness when they act in a revolutionary way. That's what changes the consciousness. You know, being determines consciousness. It's, it's idealist to think we can preach people into thinking about socialism. What you can do is that some people, we used to call it the vanguard, um, think about things. They think about their experiences. As uh, Gramsci once said, the, the, the worker peasant, the worker student alliance is an alliance between those who think because they suffer and those who suffer because they think. And yeah. that alliance means that the thinking goes between the groups of people who are oppressed and forms a consciousness and forms an understanding. But that only happens only among quite small numbers of people. I mean, when I say small, much bigger than the socialist action, much bigger than the Green uh, Caucus, maybe, maybe, I think, you know, I think it's possible to form a revolutionary caucus. A caucus of people who have some sense. Actually, I would say people who agree with Dimitri's program, with the program we worked on pretty damn revolutionary as far as I'm concerned. The, issue, the revolutionary question is what you're going to do about it, not what's in it. Um, it's a good program. I, I think there's probably about 50,000 people in Canada who would go along with that. The thing is to get them together and get them acting together, respecting each other's differences. And there's a ton of ways that that can be done and that will advance consciousness no end. Of course, that will include supporting workers who do take strike action. Um, I don't know who here has actually ever actually been an organizer in a strike, but it's not just a question that you instigate it. Uh, there's a lot of grassroots stuff that has to be done in order to get a strike, particularly a strike that's uh, the leadership are doubtful or half-hearted about, or that there's strong resistance to from the from the uh, from the bosses. So I'm not sure if instigate strike action is is what it's all about. It's about having a base that is saying, okay, I'm going for it, and that is a grassroots thing. Uh, and that is part of the organizing one does have to do. Thank you, Alan. Marianne? Yeah, I think that what's happened in the CLC with the Liberals taking over the leadership of the CLC is an absolute travesty. And I, uh, there's a campaign being organized by B. Brusque for leader of the CLC. She's uh, senior uh, with um, United Food and Commercial Workers in Winnipeg here and part of a ticket called uh, Unite. And I'm hoping that they will win and we can start to um, make sure that the, the, the labor movement isn't run by conservatives and liberals. And, um, you know, people that do want to see uh, corporate taxation and the wealth tax and, and some of these other, um, you know, many other policies that, that have to be put in place. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I guess I, I am challenged by the notion that there's going to, that we need to have this revolution. And I guess I would be satisfied to elect a government of progressive people who are wanting to, you know, create, redistribute wealth, tax corporations, build a, a social safety net again, make sure that we're not destroying the planet, um, ensure that we're following human rights and, and, and that indigenous people have sovereignty and self-government and that we can have um, a sort of a, a transition, a just transition out of the mess that we're in now. Um, and uh, so I think that that's gonna take movements, but I don't know that it, it will that the that a revolution is the only way that we can get what we need, um, and I guess that's a big part of it is that we need to have groups of people getting along well enough so that we can accomplish the goals that we have to accomplish and do what we have to do, and that really does seem to be uh, the problem. You know, when Alan was talking about people um, light up when they're talking about struggle, but not when they're talking about people. He said something like that. So I. I, I think that, you know, I've read a lot of Paulo Freire that talked about consciousness and, 
you know, with how people um, develop sort of an anti-oppressive uh, consciousness where they understand the the internalized oppression that they have and they uh, they address that. And, um, you know, we, we need to have that incorporated into the work that we do as, as activists and organizers. And, um, you know, that's what a lot of us are trying to do. Okay, thank you, Marianne. Gary, three minutes. Um, Alan uh, seemed to talk uh, about the NDP as not much compared to the Labour Party, and he may be right, but it has formed governments in almost every province of Canada and was currently re-elected by an overwhelming majority in British Columbia um, because it managed COVID based on science, epidemiology, and stood back um, it didn't get in the way of the scientists running it. So, I mean, there's, uh, uh, on the other hand, the uh, hydro in BC is just like hydro in Manitoba. Hydro uh, is building the Site C Dam, the dam that uh, has become an albatross around the neck of the NDP because it's being built on a base that can't withstand the, uh, the uh, earthquakes that are caused by the fracking it's being built to support. So uh, the NDP, yes, the NDP is a bourgeois leadership, but uh, pro-bourgeois leadership and has a reformist capitalist uh, program, but it has a labor base and the Green Party doesn't. And I'm sorry, I have to insist that the class line is absolutely a red line. I mean, um, the Green Party is a capitalist party and has nothing else going for it um, and is not going to change. I mean, uh, Dimitri can fight in it until he finally loses all his support, or he can take it out and do something with it and build something bigger. But for us, building the Revolutionary Party, we know that the revolution is made in mass upsurges caused by capitalist catastrophes and capitalist uh, uh, crises and, and capitalist contradictions. We know that. We know that the best written leaflets and speeches and, uh, and uh, prop uh, propaganda and agitation do not create revolutions. We know that. What we do know is that if, if a revolutionary opportunity opens, as it has over and over and over again, and there is no revolutionary party built with roots in the working class and experience of the struggles, then it will not come to pass. And we are we just don't want that happening in Canada. Now, as far as what Mary Ann says, she says that she wants all these really good objectives, and I support every single one of them. They're all worthy goals, but as long as you leave the ownership of the means of production, distribution, and exchange and the banking system in the hands of private billionaires, you will not get what you want. They will make sure you don't because they control everything. They control the money. They buy and sell politicians. And uh, you will it be one step forward, two steps back. We, have, we made a lot of gains in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And a lot of them have been driven back by 40 years of... Uh, of uh, neoliberalism. So you're never going to do what you want to do unless you get rid of the class that owns everything and turn that over to the working people and their allies in order to uh, run all of society in a different way. And we hope that people will join social, uh, socialist action to help us build the people who, for one reason or another, have come to revolutionary consciousness early, who are willing to work in collaboration and work in the struggle to gain the experience they need and become used to working in mass struggles. Uh, I, one of my big experiences was 1973. Wrap up, Gary. Okay. Conservatives were trying to take away the right to strike. The Trotskyists were the uh, organizers of a, principal organizers of a demonstration of 105, a strike of 105,000 teachers and 30,000 at the Queen's Park, and we stopped the bill dead. Nobody ever heard of it again. So, um, but that was a situation. I agree with, with Alan. We didn't create that situation, but because we were an experienced revolutionary leadership, we could lead it to success. And that's, that's what the Bolshevik Party does. Thank you. Okay, so special thanks to our panelists tonight, Alan, Marianne, and Gary. Thank you so very much. And to our producer, Kurt Young in Mississauga, and to everyone who participated in tonight's conversation. So please consider buying a subscription to Socialist Action newspaper. As you can see, it's only $27 a year and is delivered to your door. And maybe you would like to also... Uh, 
pick up one of our pamphlets, Eco-Socialism versus Fossil Capitalism. <laughs> okay, so anyway, if you would like to do any of this, please visit our website, www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or just call 647-986-1917. Once again, if you like the show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. Now, the next Socialist Action webcast is Thursday, December the 3rd at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And the topic is Union and the Bosses, Agenda in Auto, Public Service, and Beyond. Our speakers will be Rebecca Keach, an auto worker in Oshawa, Ontario, examines the Unifor deals with GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Sandra Griffith Bonaparte in Ottawa will look at the Public Service Alliance settlement with the Feds. And Julius R. Scott will speak on why the CLC backs liberals and how Alberta health service workers are under attack. So for these details, just go to www.socialistaction.ca. But in the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, and be active.